All right, I think this is going to be the last video on muscle physiology, but we'll see. All right, so we have gone through all of the steps, and there were a couple of things that now that you've learned all the details, there are a couple of things I wanted to talk to you about that are, that are a little more big concept, all right? So first of all, I told you ugh, a while ago that um, the sarcomere is the reason that a tiny protein movement, which is like this much, can actually create an entire muscle movement, right? So let's go back to looking at this. So here we have got the individual sarcomeres, right? So from here to here is one sarcomere, from here to here is one sarcomere. So we said that we had like maybe 25 in a row right here, and this was a microscopically small part of an individual muscle, and so that an entire muscle it could maybe have, I don't know, maybe a million sarcomeres end to end to end. And I told you that that was a reason why this was so cool. So let me do a reenactment. All right. I want you to imagine that I am standing on a skateboard, okay? And uh, from the tip of one fingertip to the tip of the other, let's say it's about five feet, okay? And as, let's imagine that I'm holding on to a Z disc at one end and a Z disc at another end. And when I say go, boom, I am going to shorten that individual sarcomere by, if this is five feet, I'm gonna shorten it by three feet, right? Now, when I do that, when I shorten it, then I'm kind of like Bart Simpson here on his skateboard, right? So if I go suddenly, boom, like this, I can shorten one sarcomere by three feet. Now, inside of your muscles, there's not just one little Bart Simpson that's going to do all of the work of contracting a muscle. Inside of your muscles, there are millions of them attached end to end to end. So if I were one person standing on a skateboard here like Bart Simpson, then I could contract um, from the Z line by three feet. But what if instead of one, we had, um, how many is that? What if instead of one, we had seven, right? And they're all now holding hands. Now, all at once, boom, as fast as I say that, all seven of them also pull their hands together and shorten from one Z disc to the other Z disc, right? Then how much would they have shortened? Well, they would have shortened three times seven or 21 feet, right? Now, let's imagine if instead of seven Bart Simpsons, because seven sarcomeres would just be a little bit. What if instead of seven, sorry, what if instead of seven Bart Simpsons, like here's one, here's one, here's one, here's one, what if instead of seven, we've got a million? Well, a million times three feet would be, well, three million feet, right? So that is how the sarcomere, because of its organization, allows a muscle proteins movement, which is far too small to be seen by this most powerful light microscope, to actually create really strong and powerful muscle movements. All right, so now we know how a myofibril contracts, right? Because each sarcomere contracts. And it contracts because the myosin can see the binding sites on the actin, so it'll grab the binding sites and do its thing. And it needs ATP for energy to do that. But ATP has another role, and ATP actually is essential if your muscle is going to relax as well. And one of the ways that it's important is ATP is the only thing that causes the myosin to let go of the actin, right? That's one step. The other step is we have got to put the calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And the only way that happens is through active transport, active transport. Remember at the beginning of this story, the calcium was real crowded inside of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. How did it get crowded? Well, the only way things get crowded on any side of a membrane is going to be active transport and active transport by definition requires ATP. So there are, uh, pro there are uh, calcium pumps that are constantly at work in the membrane of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And in the membrane of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, they are constantly putting the calcium back inside. Um, that uh, 
that action is going to steal the calcium from the, the sarcomere. And when calcium leaves the sarcomere, calcium will no longer be attached to troponin. And when calcium is no longer attached to troponin, the troponin tropomycin complex covers up the binding sites on the actin again. And so even though at that moment, myosin might be ready to do another little motion, um, another little power stroke, it won't be able to grab onto the binding site on actin, so it'll just have to wait. And so then the muscle is going to end up relaxing. That leads us to the concept of rigor mortis. In, in, there are two ways that what we're talking about here get applied in real life. One is rigor mortis, which is the stiffness of death, which we're going to talk about. But the other way is when you get a Charlie horse. Ha, have you ever wondered why when you uh, use a muscle so much that it gets so tired that in, it cramps up? Well, doesn't that seem backwards to you? It always feels backwards to me. I mean, if the muscle's so, re, so um, uh, used and so tired that, that it can't work anymore, why would it cramp up? It seems like it should go limp, right? Ditto with dead people. Dead people, they don't have any ATP anymore, so shouldn't they go limp? Why do they turn stiff as boards for a period of time? And when dead bodies turn stiff as boards, um, that is called rigor mortis. So there are two roles that ATP plays in muscle cell contraction. One is that it runs the active transport pump, the calcium pump, that pumps the calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. If a muscle has run out of ATP, either because it's exercising too hard or you're dead, then one of the things that can't happen anymore is calcium can't get pumped back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum anymore. So in the absence of ATP, calcium stays out in the sarcomere, stays attached to troponin, and the tropomycin continues to expose the binding sites on the actin. So that'll keep the muscle contracting. The second thing is, without any ATP at all, and this really mostly only happens when you're dead, without any ATP at all, then those myosins also, they're at the point where they've done the uh, power stroke, where they've, where they've contracted um, on the um, actin, but they can't let go. And since they can't let go, uh, there's not gonna be any muscle relaxation. So all of this, uh, physiology you learned explains how you get a cramp in your muscle or a charlie horse. It also explains the rigor mortis of death. This is a related concept. I think you will have covered this in your lab when you learn about uh, muscle contraction, but uh, there is something that we will observe in a laboratory environment when instead of using neurotransmitter the normal way to stimulate muscle contraction, we use a little electrical zap. So let me show you this. If there's a little electrical zap, there's a little lag time before we actually see the contraction. And with a single little zap, there'll get a single little muscle twitch. Now, if you zap a person periodically, you'll get a twitch that might look like this and then this and then this. But if you start zapping a person closer and closer together, what you'll notice is that subsequent twitches will be stronger, right? And the more closely together you send those zaps, the stronger the muscle contraction will be until you're zapping so close together that you actually get a smooth and powerful muscle contraction. Now, as those uh, twitches are coming closer and closer together, that ends up getting called summation. Sometimes it gets called unfused or incomplete tenderness too. Um, and what's going on here? What's happening has everything to do with the calcium pump that's present in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. You know, I often think of it as every time the uh, zap arrives, the sarcoplasmic reticulum has got gates that open up and some of the calciums, kind of like little lost sheep, go wandering out into the sarcomere. And it's up to the sarcoplasmic reticulum to gather them all back. Well, if there's one little zap, then a, like three sheep leave, 
And then there's plenty of time in between zaps for the sarcoplasmic reticulum to put all the little calciums back into the pen, right? But if the zaps get really close together, then the sarcoplasmic reticulum has just regathered one or two sheep by the time three more get out. And then she puts one or two of those back and then three more get out. And so what happens is as the gates are opened closer and closer together in time, more and more calcium stays out into the sarcomere. And the more calciums there are out there, the more of the tropomycins are exposing the actin binding sites and the stronger the contraction can be. <clears throat> now, I wanted to tell you a little bit about um, muscle growth and muscle atrophy. So it is the dominant hypothesis that humans have exactly the same number of muscle cells that they are born with, like for their whole life. And the reason your muscles are so much bigger than they were when you were five years old is because of muscle cell hypertrophy. Hypertrophy. Hypertrophy is the word for when cells get bigger. Now, uh, we would love to be able to figure out how to do muscle hyperplasia, but we're not able to do that yet. <clears throat> so this is an image looking through a microscope at some cells that are very normal and some cells that have atrophied. Now, this particular muscle biopsy, it comes from someone that has multiple sclerosis. And the reason that these muscle cells here are so small is because there's been no stimulation from a somatic motor neuron of those cells because of the multiple sclerosis. So they are allowing themselves to get small and they get smaller by having fewer myofibrils inside of them. Um, if, if this kind of problem has been caused by multiple sclerosis, then it, those cells will not recover unless um, there is a cure to their multiple sclerosis. But if some of your muscles look like that just because you haven't been able to work out for a while, then once you start working out, they will start looking like that again. And they will look like that because they will have more myofibrils inside of them. What about cardiac and smooth muscle? I'm not going to spend very much time on this because we're going to have a lot of discussion of heart muscle cells as soon as we get into the cardiovascular system. I did want to emphasize that all of this story that we have about sarcomeres and troponin and tropomyosin and the role of calcium, all of that is true. It just is slightly different for muscle cells and we'll talk about that when we get to the cardiovascular system. Smooth muscle is very, very different. And we will be talking about smooth muscle also in the cardiovascular system and the respiratory system because it is smooth muscle that will contract to raise your blood pressure or relax to lower your blood pressure. Um, but smooth muscle has got a very different organization of its actin and myosin. It has got really a lot of actin and the not as much myosin and they are not arranged into sarcomeres. Uh, on the other hand, the role of ATP and the binding sites on the actin, all of that is similar with smooth muscle. Let's go over a couple of quiz questions, okay? Which of the following lists has the steps of muscle cell contraction in the proper order? So what is the proper order? Ligand gated channels open, okay, that would happen in the synapse. Calcium gets released. That happens down at the sarcoplasmic reticulum when the voltage gated calcium channels open. Action potential travels to the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Now this is not in order, right? Because it's not until after, it's not until after the action potential reaches the sarcoplasmic reticulum that the calcium gets released. Okay, so number one is not the one. Ligand-gated channels open, voltage-gated channels open, calcium is released, that's in, that's in the right order. The ligand-gated channels open at the synapse, then voltage-gated channels open in the uh, sarcolemma, goes down the T-tubules, open up voltage-gated channels in the sarcoplasmic reticulum, calcium is released. So then this one should be, uh, 
this last one, number three, that's all kinds of wrong. So the correct answer is two. Okay. What about this one? What, are, what is the proper order? Neurotransmitters get released, action potentials travel down the T tubules, calcium floods into the cytoplasm. Well, that seems like it's in the right order. Let's read the other one. Action potentials go down the T tubules, calcium is released from, ah, the sarcolemma. Calcium doesn't get released from the sarcolemma. It gets released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So that one would have been in the right order if that would have been the term sarcoplasmic reticulum instead of sarcolemma, right? Neurotransmitters released into the synapse, calcium released from the No, that's out of order. Those second two steps are out of order. So the correct answer for this one is one. Did this change? Okay, now we've got number three. Calcium removes troponin tropomycin from the myosin molecules. No, that's not right. Calcium's troponin and tropomycin is not on the myosin, it's on the actin. Calcium removes troponin tropomycin from the actin molecules. Okay, that's correct. Myosin binds to the actin, and then ATP binds to the myosin, causing it to release the actin. All right, that looks like it's in the right order. All right, let's look at number three. Calcium removes troponin tropomycin from the actin molecules. ATP binds to the actin. No, that's not right. Okay, so the correct answer for this one is two.